So we kick off with the ancient stuff still squeezing through a little as Daniel decides the best path forward is to annoy O'Neill, finally taking away his crossword puzzle. Well, there's actually a clue in there, or rather, several possible clues in the answers that O'Neill has been writing in ancient. The clue for seven down is celestial body, and he wrote Uma Thurman. Well, super science isn't an exact science. O'Neill decides it's lunchtime, during which he pulls the mission patch off of Daniel's uniform, twists it around, and says, at. When Daniel draws another symbol, he says, shh, leading Daniel to conclude that Proclerouge Teonas is the gate address. The symbols are phonetic. Only problem is the gate on that planet is buried, so we'll have to hope Tilk and Break Tech can hook them up with a ride. Until we find out, all Jack can do is gather his shit up for the trip. Grab a knack with a generator, will you? Luckily, we got that requisition of kitchen sinks. And good news, Braytech and Teal get a visit from a Jaffa who has a ship and is prepared to lend it, provided he gets to come along. Insurance reasons, I'm sure. So, soon, SG-1 and O'Neill's extreme luggage needs are loaded onto the ship, heading for Procler Rouge Teonas. Carter did a reverse lookup on the gate address. Good if you want to deal with those grebulons who tried to scam you. Back on Earth... Mr. President, a short time ago, our space-based radar detected three ghoul vessels emerging from hyperspace. And the worst part is that technically he should end that sentence with, Again. Hammond advises that only three ships means that Anubis is holding back, seeing if SG-1 found a means to stop his invasion, which they haven't yet. And so it's for that reason that Hammond suggests not sending out the Prometheus and their space fighter craft that were built specifically to protect us against a Gould invasion in order to deal with this Gould invasion. Not to worry, it actually makes a lot of sense. If we send that, Anubis will know that it's all that we've got, so he's going to swoop in with his full fleet and mop the floor with us. If we don't, though, then that will make Anubis wonder if we're trying to goad him into committing to a full invasion so we can wipe him out. So that will buy some time for SG-1 to try to find this uber weapon or whatever it is at the Lost City and hope we can get it out and get it back here without customs stopping us. O'Neill is doing his part, using his special knowledge to supercharge the ship so it can fly really fast and all while assuring Carter that she can take command with a clear conscience. In fact, making her the commander of the team right there on the spot. He remains the master of multitasking. Sir, at your house before Daniel and Tilk showed up, what I was going to say was... I know. No need to say it. I was right about Mr. Burns being a ghouled. As for Anubis, he's moving forward as expected, beginning the attack with just the three ships for now, to see what defense Earth brings. Hopefully, it'll be something impressive, but the sight of the lava-coated planet is not inspiring a lot of confidence. O'Neill has no idea why they're even here, but he did bring a long hazmat suit, so that suggests that we should go down there instead of staying in orbit and just looking at this planet. Carter orders O'Neill to take the helm, and he leads them to an anomaly, a perfect dome, suggesting that at some point a force field existed, was covered by lava, which then cooled, and then the shield failed. It was millions of years ago. Someone probably turned it off to keep the electric bill down. Back on planet Earth, the attack begins as we hear from the USS Spruance, a destroyer that, in this reality, is assigned to the Nimitz carrier group. The captain informs them that they just saw a beam come out of nowhere and destroy the Nimitz. That's the ship we looked at in the final countdown, if the name sounds familiar. And during their conversation, a carrier in the group gets taken out, inexplicably vaporized by a beam from the sky. This is not good. You know, ironically, the USS Nimitz is still in service. While just a few years after this episode aired, the USS Spruance was decommissioned and during a training exercise was intentionally targeted and sunk. Or are we covering for something the aliens did, huh? SG-1 uses the rings to break through the lava and enter the cavern below. And while it's kind of radioactive, it otherwise seems rather reasonably preserved for a million years or so. 
O'Neill finds a big chair and sits in it, activates something, and that allows him to set up a force field around them and purify the air so it's safe to breathe and no longer radioactive. While he's kicking back, O'Neill brings up a holographic representation of the galaxy, focuses in on the Earth, at least as it was about 30 million years ago, and says, Terra Atlantis, revealing that the place they've been looking for is under the ice of Antarctica. Well, they're a little put out that they flew all the way the hell out here, just need to go back to where they started. They could have skipped this trip, but there's something here that it turns out we actually need. Out of the floor, O'Neill pulls what we will later refer to as a ZPM. And with foreknowledge, we know this is great when you want to kick some ass. There's just one snag. <laughs> Turns out their new friend's a little stab happy. But this guy is not up on current events. Braytech uses that new compound in place of a gould. So the normally fatal wound is more of a nuisance right now. Despite being older and wounded, Braytech is able to take down the traitor and activates the rings to bring everyone up before the dome collapses on them. But a gut wound is still a gut wound, and he is dying. But somehow O'Neill is able to heal him with his touch. Wow. For his next miracle, he'll turn water into Guinness. On Earth, the attack is halted after wiping out the carrier group, but then Anubis sends a projection into the Oval Office. Though that doesn't stop. Yeah, I just know my taxes are going up from those trigger-happy buffoons. Anubis pulls the come and kneel before Zod on him, but the president refuses. In fact, he decides the best defense is a good offense, saying he's prepared to accept Anubis' surrender and just generally doing everything short of puffing himself up to look bigger. But Anubis doesn't buy it and sends in the rest of his fleet. Kinsey can now see just how screwed they are, and urges the president to relocate command off-world through the Stargate. But the president is staying here, though he gives Kinsey permission to leave Earth if he wants to. You're all welcome to join him. And be stuck under President Kinsey if this doesn't work out? Yeah, no thanks. I'll take my chances with the alien zombie Terminators. On the way back to Earth, O'Neill is changing the rings with all his junk, causing severe strain in my ability to continue resisting the obvious MacGyver jokes. In a touching moment, we see that Tilk is on the verge of succumbing to his emotions at the sight of O'Neill as this detached other person, seemingly barely aware of things around him. So it's all the more telling when O'Neill suddenly stops and reaches out to touch his friend to say with his look and his gestures what his words no longer can. Well, with the full fleet here and knocking out power and communications, it's really time to send out the Prometheus and their fighter fleet. It's not going to be enough, but it's something. we got to justify those tax dollars somehow. Oh, and the power distribution also shuts down the Stargate, meaning Kinsey is stuck in the SGC with no way out. Aw, too bad. Being stuck on the planet you doomed in your stubbornness? Someone get a shrink ray so we can play the world's tiniest violin. Fortunately, Dr. Weir has her head on right and orders a manual closing of the iris. They can't dial out, but Anubis can dial in and sends through a nuke that would have vaporized the whole of the SGC. Kinsey responds by further panicking. Nice to know someone's on top of that important job. And when she tries to advise the president, he butts in. I am relieving Dr. Weir and taking command sir, of this facility. from what I've looked at... Will you shut the hell up? I'm sorry, sir. Not you, doctor. Yeah, it's long past time to can his ass and leaves us free to address the crisis. Weir advises letting Prometheus cover for SG-1 while they work on whatever crazy thing Jack is doing. And Hammond takes personal command of the ship for this fight. But it came close to being, well, pointless because... In order to get past the fleet, they had to come out of hyperspace really close to the atmosphere, and Tilk barely avoids crashing into a mountain, which would have ended in cannibalism. I've seen enough movies to know that. But they make it and head to an area about where the second Stargate was found all those years ago, and O'Neill takes over the rest of the way. Then he uses the modified rings to melt through the ice so that they can use the rings to head to the set of rings that are down below. 
but a newest force has picked up their arrival and they haven't actually made it down there yet. A problem because he's got a whole lot of atmosphere capable craft of heading over there and blowing them up first. Luckily, Hammond of Texas knows when the cavalry should come over the hill. Prometheus, stealing fire from the gods and handing it back with interest. So SG-1 finishes melting the ice and uses the rings to head to Terra Atlantis down below. Anubis is waiting for them, but it's just another projection, trying to stop Jack from reaching the chair. Nope, he walks right through it, replaces the dead ZPM with the one they took from Proclarouche Teonas, but Anubis is already sending down his cull warriors to kill them forcing the other three to cover for him while O'Neill does his thing. And it's an impressive thing. More of the ice melts, a glow emerges, and soon thousands of drones swirl up, taking out the Cull Warriors and then the entire fleet. Uh, we have the tools, we have the talent. But the victory comes at a cost. O'Neill is on death's door. Yet there is hope. Earlier he saw this nook and said the ancient word for sleep and now took places him inside and he's put into some kind of suspended animation and daniel tells carter that this isn't the lost city this may be terra atlantis but it's just an outpost like the place that they visited and whatever the case we are not saving o'neill in the next few minutes you're gonna have to wait until after the to be continued carter the lost city is a must see it is the culmination of years of storytelling and introduces a whole new direction for the series, and indeed paves the way for the first spin-off with Atlantis. The story gets a stamp of strongly recommended. It has everything. Heart, quiet moments, big climactic battles, impressive ships, wit, good guys, bad guys, and one thing that I particularly enjoyed, what I think of as the Dr. Weir grounding. As someone who is completely new to all of this, it shows just how enormous and shocking the normalcy of all of this is. When Daniel goes off about Anubis being half ghouled, half ascended ancient, it is madness. Yet only when seen from the perspective of a normal person. For those of us with experience with the show, this is all old hat. I love that about this episode. It really made the enormity of the stakes easier to feel, to sense how outclassed our poor species is by comparison. I also want to praise the Tilk O'Neill scene once again. With Carter and with Daniel, the point was made clear that O'Neill knew that nothing needed to be said. He made clear he already knows. With Tilk, he understands that even though he doesn't have the words anymore, Something does need to be said in this case. And both Anderson and Judge give that scene all that it needs. What's hardest to parse is this Dr. Weir and the Dr. Weir that we know. According to a recent interview, the actor who played Weir in this two-parter believes that she was recast because of her connection to Burning Man, and that that plus the fact that she lied about seeing family rather than admitting she was going there gave the producers the impression that she wasn't going to be committed to the show the way that was needed. It would be fascinating to see how things would have gone with her in the role, as her performances seem capable of far more nuance than Higginson, in my opinion. But overall, The Lost City was a great example of SG-1 and a definite series highlight. I again call this one strongly recommended for your viewing pleasure. 